So welcome to a presentation about secure networking with SSL. My name is Peter Hartmann. I work for Nokia. And I prepared a presentation which lasts about uh, 45 minutes, maybe. I'll go into quite some details about SSL and show you how, can do, how you can do that with Qt. So yeah, this is an un un advanced topic, so it might get quite technical there. And then, of course, we'll also have time for questions afterwards. So before we start, a little bit about myself. Who am I? I'm Peter Hartmann. I'm from Germany. I'm a software engineer at Nokia. I work on Qt. Within Qt, I work mostly on networking. And within networking, I work mostly on HTTP. And then I also work on SSL, hence this talk. Um, maybe you've seen other presentations about networking. There was uh, my talk yesterday about web services, which was pretty high level. There was this morning a presentation from Markus about um, basic networking. And now we have this SSL talk. So if you've seen my presentation yesterday or my presentation from last year from Death Days, I also told you that I was playing football for our cute football club. And of course, in case you're wondering, I still am playing for Qt FC. So that's it about me. Now about this presentation, what is the goal? I mean, the topic is secure networking with SSL. That might be a lot. So what I hope you can take away from this presentation is that I want to give you a little overview over SSL, both the benefits and problems. You might have read recently a lot about um, several attacks, like the Digi Notar case was maybe the most notably one. There was also this beast attack, which caused uh, quite some action. And I want to explain how SSL works in practice and also what its problems are. And then, of course, also how you can use SSL with Qt. So let's have a look at the agenda. First topic, which is actually the biggest topic, is some um, general introduction or overview over SSL. Then afterwards, I'm going to talk about the Qt APIs, how you can access SS SSL with Qt. And then, if time permits, I'll also show you a little example. Let's see if we have time for that. And of course, in case you have a question, just raise your hands and then at any time. So. And then please wait for the microphone, and then we can answer the question. So let's start with SSL. I'm going to provide a little introduction. Then I'm going to talk about certificates, because it's a, an important part of SSL. So th that's a topic of its own, in a way. And then I'm also going to talk about problems of SSL. But let's start with the introduction. So well, what is SSL? As you can see here, SSL sits between TCP and application layer protocols. Yes, SSL stands for uh, Secure Socket Layer. And you might have heard of TLS, which is actually a version of a newer version of the SSL protocol in a way. So I'll just use the SSL term overall to describe both like SSL versions and TLS. So yes. Uh, SSL is sort of transparent. You use it on top of TCP. And on top of SSL, you can use HTTP. As you probably all know, you have these HTTPS uh, addresses in your browser bar. And you can use any application layer protocol on top of SSL, like as you can see here, IMAP or any other protocol. Uh, you can also use, I think there's a version of uh, TLS that works over UDP, but I won't cover that here. So now, this might be the typical slide that you see in a university lecture, like the conceptual overview over SSL. What does it provide? What is it supposed to do? It basically provides uh, three things. One is confidentiality, meaning the message is secret. So for instance, if you're on a public Wi-Fi, you don't want your uh, traffic to be visible, especially if it's a username and password, if you log into your Facebook account or whatever. So you want to have your message to be secret. Another point is integrity, meaning the message has not been changed. So SSL makes sure that uh, the message you receive is actually the message that has been sent at the other end. And then you want the message to be authentic. 
meaning the message is uh, genuine, so you, you know who you're talking to, in a way. Yes, so how does SSL provide all these uh, functionality? The confidentiality is done through encryption. It's a combination of asymmetric and symmetric encryption. I won't dive into the details there for now. Integrity, it provides by having message signatures and authenticity by certificates. Again, certificates I'm going to talk about later. So that's the common high-level technical overview over SSL. There's three main things, and if, you, if one is compromised, then of course it affects the other two as well. So you always want all three. Now about SSL versioning. There are several different versions. The oldest one is SSL2. It's deprecated and considered broken, so it's insecure. Uh, please don't use it. I know several Linux dis distributions have it uh, disabled, so you're just not supposed to use it. The versions that you're supposed to use and that uh, many applications like browsers and others use are SSL3 and TLS 1.0. They are several years, years old as well, but uh, they are still in, in use. That's also what the browsers use. And then there are some newer versions that are not in use yet or are becoming adopted right now, which is TLS 1.1, which is not supported widely yet, and neither is TLS 1.2. Uh, quick question, how many of you have heard of this uh, beast attack? A few? Okay, it was some attack that... Um, you could uh, yeah, attack TLS 1.1, which was uh, then solved in a way by TLS 1.1. TLS it was solved in TLS 1.0, not yet. So yes, that might be a benefit of TLS 1.1. But anyway, let's look into a simple example how SSL works. So again, typical setup, you have your client on the left, you have your server on the right, and you communicate over the network, which is considered insecure. Example, again, uh, public Wi-Fi. So how does it work? You have several messages. First, the client says hello to the server. I want to initiate an SSL, a secure handshake, and I can offer you those uh, types of encryption in a way, several ciphers. Server also says hello and chooses a cipher. And the server also presents a certificate so that the client knows who it's talking to. Then the client on his side verifies this certificate. We're going to look into that in a few, few minutes, how this exactly works. And then it acknowledges that everything is fine in case the certificate is valid and everything. It says, uh, OK, cipher spec acknowledged and finished, meaning, OK, we're now encrypted. And oh, wrong button, sorry. Server also says, OK finished, encrypted, and then the application traffic can begin. So whenever you enter HTTPS something in your browser, then first this happens, and before the real HTTP data is, is uh, served over the network. Yes. So this verify server certificate leads us to our next topic, certificates. There's a standard called X.509. So what does, it, does a certificate typically contain? It contains a subject, which in the case of using SSL over the web, contains the DNS name. Like DNS name meaning google.com or facebook.com or whatever site you connect to. Then it contains the issuer, which is the certificate authority, in short CA, that signed the certificate. Um, you have an, uh, can you name some certificate authorities? Have you heard of some? VeriSign, yes, maybe the biggest one. Do you know more? DigiNotarius, <laughs> famous or infamous, but I think they've gone bankrupt by now. <laughs> okay, yeah, there are some, but yeah, I, VeriSign is probably the most famous one. Then what is also contained in a certificate is the public key, so you can verify that the author is uh, who it claimed to be. And then there are some extensions. 
for instance, alternative DNS names. You can have, for instance, I can show you later, uh, the cute.nokia.com certificate has another alternative DNS name in its, in its certificate as well. So let's check out maybe a certificate. I can show you that. I'm going to switch to the console, and I'm using the OpenSSL command line tool. Is that big enough, the font, by the way? Can you read it in the back? OK. So I, have, I had the file locally on my machine before. I downloaded it before here in this file. And then I asked OpenSSL to print all the details. So what did we have? We had the subject line. You can see here. Most importantly, it contains the common name attribute, which contains cute.nokia.com. And that attribute actually must match the host name that you're using in the browser. Another thing is the issue line. It's a long line. You can see here, blah, 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 something, something with VeriSign. So it appears to be signed by VeriSign. What else did we have? We had the public key to verify. We had alternative DNS names. In this case, it's cute.nokia.com and www.cute.nokia.com. And we have some more extensions. Yes. So that's a basic certificate. So actually, if you connect via SSL to a server, for instance, by a browser or by any other means, the server usually not only sends you one certificate, it sends you a whole chain. So our next topic, certificate chains. The one I just showed you right now is the leaf certificate, server certificate, which contains, among others, the subject uh, with the DNS name. That certificate is, is usually signed by an intermediate certificate. In this case, it's signed by VeriSign as well. And interestingly, the subject line from the intermediate certificate is the issue line in the signed certificate. And then the chain might be actually arbitrarily long. I mean, in practice, not arbitrarily. I think browsers check uh, up to, how is it, 20 or something. But it might be more intermediate certificates to come, which are always signed by each other. And then at the end, there's a root certificate. Now, the root certificate is not sent by the server because it's uh, built into the client. And root, root certificates are always self-signed, meaning, among other, that subject and issuer are the same. So I can quickly show you on my Linux box. You have the certificates under slash etc slash SSL certs. Oh, like this. Yeah. So you see there are a lot from VeriSign, 40. If I scroll up, there are more from Swiss Sign, Trust Center, and a lot more. So on Linux, they're in this directory. On Windows, it also comes with a certificate store, and each operating system has the root certificates built in. So revocation of certificates. Sometimes it happens that certificate authorities are compromised. For instance, in the Commodore, how many of you have heard of Commodore, the Commodore Gate or the Digi Notar Breach? OK, that's a lot, but not all of them. So sometimes the, if the certificate authority loses its keys that are used to sign a certificate, then actually at the attacker that managed to steal the keys can sign any certificate. So sometimes certificates needs to, need to be revoked. In the case of Komoto and Dikinotar, it was not that the keys were lost. It was just that the infrastructure to sign certificates was compromised. So still the attackers managed to issue themselves certificates. So sometimes they need to be revoked. So how do you do that? There's one technique called certificate revocation lists, uh, in short CRL, which is a list by the certificate authority that is published and periodically updated. So a client, for instance, a browser, can query it from the certificate authority and then check all the certificates that are revoked, and then it wouldn't trust them anymore. Now, the problem is that the list uh, might be quite long. And usually, when you want to connect to a site, you want to just check the 
certificate that you're connecting to right now. So in order to do that, there's something called Online Certificate Status Protocol, in short, OCSP. And that does actually what I just described. It has the certificate contains a URL, which says, oh, please connect to that site to check the status of the certificate. And then it will connect that server, connect to that server, and ask for the status of the certificate, which might be valid or revoked or something in between. Now, yes, can you maybe see a problem with that? It's not really an architectural problem, more like a technical problem. You want to connect to, for instance, Facebook. Facebook certificate contains a URL of the certificate server, and then you check the server. Is the state is certificate OK or not? There's something that might be not that. Uh, yes, that might be one point, because the connection is over HTTP to the OCSP server. That might be a problem. And another thing might be that it's like not that practical, because it uh, puts a high load on the OCSP server if you, every time you connect, somebody connects to Facebook, checks the status. So there's another thing called, called OCSP stapling, meaning that the server that sends you the certificate will send you its status. Now, that sounds a bit weird, doesn't it? <laughs> because, I mean, then an attacker could uh, present you a, a, a rogue certificate and saying, oh, yeah, it's all fine. Actually, the thing here with OCSP stapling is that uh, the answer is signed by the certificate authority. So in that case, you can check that it's, it's all good. And then it, you don't put that high load on the, on the OCSP server. Yes, so that's it about revocation. Now, so far it seemed all fine. SSL provides these uh, three things, and there are uh, certificates and everything. It maybe sounded all nice to you, but there are some problems. Let's stay a moment with certificates. One big problem, any CA can sign certificates for any domain. You can see here uh, an example of one of the 250 infamous certificates signed by, or not signed by, but like issued by Digi Notar. You see in the subject line, it's valid for all .google.com domains and issued by Digi Notar. So it's a valid certificate. All browsers would accept it. And the interesting thing is in the Digi Notar case, Digi Notar and Google never talked to each other, never had any, any communication going on. It was just that the attackers managed to break the Digi Notar uh, infrastructure and issued them any certificate, issued themselves certificates for sites, for instance, google.com, and then any browser would accept it. So that's one big problem. Another problem. The RFC for certificates allows for arbitrary content. This is a certificate from our test repository. It contains a subject with a DNS name, example.com, an email address, and a favorite drink, which is a perfectly valid certificate. So you can put in a lot of information into the certificate, and it still stays valid. And I mean, in practice, probably you wouldn't need the favorite drink in a certificate, I assume. But still, you can do that if you want. Next problem. The subject and the issuer field have a complex structure. You can see here, this is the, if I recall correctly, this is the issue line from the qt.nokia.com certificate. For instance, it contains two attributes with the same name, like OU, which stands for organizational unit. So in practice, they, that this makes it sometimes hard to parse. Now, maybe one of the biggest problems with certificates, there are a lot of certificate authorities around. It's like, according to the EFF, it's 650 organizations that are trusted by Mozilla or Microsoft, which is really a lot. I mean, I wouldn't have guessed that it's so many. Usually people have heard of VeriSign, and there are a few more you would have guessed. But uh, in practice, it's a lot more. For instance, this is a very small excerpt of a huge map. You can download it at the URL on the bottom of all certificate 
authorities, and there are some surprising ones. There's, for instance, you can see in the middle, Bayerische Staatsbibliothek, which is the Bavarian State Library. So they can issue certificates for any domain. Or the University of the Military in Munich, or there are a lot more universities than ca that can issue certificates. There's, uh, I think, Walt Disney, which can issu issue certificates, which all makes it a bit, yeah, not so easy to have an overview. And especially combined with the first problem that I showed you, that any certificate authority can sign certificates for any domain, this makes it really an explosive mix, if you want. I mean, maybe the Bavarian State Library has the security structure and everything all set up nicely and everything. I don't know. It might very well be. It's just that there are so many certificate authorities around that it's hard to keep track of. And I think it's maybe not too negative to say that among the, among the 650 CAs, there are probably several which have not that great of a security architecture, which has been seen in the past. So, more problems. Problems with SSL and the World Wide Web. How many of you have heard of FireSheep? Oh, not so many. So, okay. Some sites on the internet use SSL for logging in. For instance, if you go to facebook.com and you log in with your username and password, that will be sent over SSL. All good. Nobody can read it. So what Facebook then does is it sends you a cookie, so-called login cookie, which you need to resend every time you access Facebook so that Facebook knows that you're logged in. Now, the problem is several sites, Facebook was one of them, <coughs> Uh, would only have SSL for the login, but not for the consecutive traffic. So you would send the login cookie in, in over plain HTTP, and then anybody on the same network could just intercept the traffic via Wireshark, or Firesheep is a nice tool, and then just send the login cookie as well. And then it would look like this. If you try out Firesheep, you can see instantly who is logged in to Facebook or Twitter or Flickr, as you can see here, and then you can just pose as the people on, on the web. So I think now Facebook has this opt-in feature to use SSL all the way, which I really recommend you to <laughs> enable. And there are several sites that use SSL all the way. I think uh, Gmail was among the first some time ago already. I think um, Hotmail uses it as well. And there are several sites that use, have this opt-in feature for using SSL all the way. So if sites use SSL for logging in only, cannot intercept the password, but you can still intercept things like login cookies. Another problem. Mixed content on HTML pages. So what is mixed content? Imagine you retrieve a site via SSL, an HTML site, and usually an SSL site references other elements like images, CSS files, JavaScript files. Mixed content means that you retrieve the main page over SSL, but then the resources that are referenced from that page are referenced via HTTP. And now imagine you retrieve a site over SSL, and then from that site, a JavaScript file over plain HTTP, then that JavaScript file could just alter your whole DOM tree of the page. And then, again, it's not secure if it's not loaded over SSL. So luckily, I can show you an example. Luckily, browsers have become a bit more strict about that. So they would show you a little warning if you use mixed content. Let's see. Let's go to YouTube. So I'm going to YouTube, and here the browser says, OK, the font might be a little small, but it says, Encryp encryption is connected. However, this page includes other resources which are not secure. So what you want for SSL sites, you want to have SSL all the way from all re referenced sites. And actually, mixed content might also mean that you have SSL content from different certificate authorities. So you might have uh, elements which have an ultimate trust in VeriSign, and then you have, might have other other certificate authorities, which might also be a problem, but 
Of course, if you have, don't have SSL at all on some elements, that's a lot worse. More problems with SSL and the World Wide Web. Um, yes, of course, certificate authorities get compromised. Again, the DigiNotar case and Commodo Gate. DigiNotar was especially bad because um, their OCSP server wouldn't uh, return a bad response. So, meaning the certificates were not revoked; they were just revoked after one month, and then it was already too late. More problems. Servers might be misconfigured. Some still offer SSL2, which is deprecated or insecure. Some use weak ciphers and all the other things. Yes, another interesting thing, SSL bootstrap problem. So let me ask you, if you browse a site and you browse to, let's say, facebook.com or any, any site that uses SSL, how many of you type in HTTP S colon slash slash www.facebook.com. Really? <laughs> oh, that's more than I would have expe expected. So, problem here is that if you're lazy like me and most other people, you don't bother to type in the HTTPS. You just type in facebook.com or www.facebook.com and then the first request would be sent over HTTP which could then be intercepted as well and direct you to some, some other site. So, of course, it would be nice if the very first request would be over SSL already. And then, of course, you have the generic problem of users always clicking through errors. They click accept, OK, yes, yes, sure. But again, luckily, browsers make it harder these days to just click through errors. I think with uh, Firefox, it's all you need to have four or five or six clicks, I don't know, to really accept. And then you have to confirm the security exception, everything. So that's actually a good thing so that you make users aware if there's something going on, going on something fishy. Yes, so these are some of the problems. Now let's look into some trends that try to mitigate those problems. Strict transport security, in short, HSTS. HSTS is supposed to solve the problem of the bootstrap thing, that you have your first request over HTTP only. So how it works is that this, when you connect to a site and the server wants to use SSL, the server sends you back a special HTTP header saying, please connect to SSL next time, and, and then it sends you a time value, like, do this for the next few hours or so over the next day or something like this. And then the browser knows, OK, next time I connect to the site for the next hours, I just use SSL all the way. So then if you type in your URL, it would automatically switch to SSL on the first request, so you don't have the bootstrap problem anymore. I think it's enabled in Chrome, in recent releases of Chrome and Firefox. Another trend, server name indication. Yeah, that's actually not trying to solve any of the problems I showed you before. It's more that um, sometimes you have the problem if you connect to a server, especially when you have this uh, virtual hosting and all that stuff, that the server doesn't know which site you're trying to connect to. So it might host different certificates depending on the site you want to connect to. In case you have been to Marcus's uh, network session in the morning, you saw that there was the host, the HTTP host header, which also deals with this problem. So you have the host header where you send the server, OK, I want to connect to this host on an HTTP level. Now, problem with SSL th is that the server needs to know before it even comes to HTTP traffic which server you're trying to connect to. So server name indication sends the name of the server you're trying to expect, you're expecting, and then the server can react to that. It can say, OK, client wants this certificate, I can send this certificate. More trends. Yes, certificate pinning. Um, that's interesting because that's actually how the DigiNotar uh, breach was discovered. So Google Chrome has this feature that it has for its own sites, like all the Google.com sites and I think YouTube and Picasa and all that stuff, it has a whitelist of certificate authorities that it, that it knows that have signed 
uh, Google certificates. So in the case of DigiNotar, DigiNotar was not in this whitelist. So when a user, I think it was in Iran, browsed to some Google site, and then it would be presented the rogue certificate, the bad one, from DigiNotar, Google Chrome would check the whitelist and say, oh, wait, the DigiNotar is not in our list of certificate authorities. And then it would um, print an error message, right? There's something wrong going on. This can't be, this can't be right. So you see maybe a problem with that certificate pinning. If for SSL sites you have a white list of certificate authorities that might have signed this, it's again more like a practical problem. Yes, first thing, you have to stick to that. I mean, what if you want to change your certificate authority? And then another thing is that um, it just doesn't scale. You would have, imagine, you cannot have a, a list of certificate authorities for each site in the world that uses SSL. So it's a nice and pragmatic thing. Google does it for its own sites. And I think also the, I heard that the Tor project want to use it, but it doesn't scale for any site that uses SSL. So it's a nice thing, but it doesn't solve like really the root cause of the problem. Another trend, OCSP stapling. It's the thing I explained to you before. It's that the server sends the status of its certificate, which is signed by the certificate authority. Um, OCSP stapling is not really a trend. It's more like, I hope it will become a trend soon. Yes. So this was my little introduction to SSL. If you have any questions, feel free to ask. What I understood from your uh, talk is that maybe the biggest user is, or the problem is still the user, because you can click uh, five items, but my goal is still to uh, view the page where I want to go to. Yes. That's so it's just a burden, and it will not restrict me from going to that. <coughs> so how would you solve? Or <laughs> no, I know you can add extra clicks and, an, and another one. and. Yes, so I mean, the, well, the, <laughs> the really strict way would be to just not load the page at all, but I mean, that's too strict. You cannot, you probably don't want to do that. Um, again, I mean, the security model just involves the user, so you cannot exclude the user from the whole security model and say, oh, it's all secure. You need just the user to be aware of it. So there's no proper solution in that case. Again, the really <laughs> strict way would be to then make it impossible to load the page, but Browsers, I guess, don't want to do that neither. So, um, yeah, I think browsers, they try to do what's best. Google Chrome has this uh, red bar with the HTTPS strike and through in red if there's something going on. So, but then still, users might ignore it, but then it's their fault in a way. So, yes. Does it help a bit? So, yeah. <laughs> part is sometimes, as, as the hosting provider, uh, when you can uh, be sure that the, the, the customer or the, the user is accessing you in, a, in an invalid way, is to basically exclude them from your services. Um, what do you mean, uh, accessing in an invalid so, way? So uh, if, if uh, you are providing an HTTPS site uh, and the certificates don't match uh, it's, it could be a responsibility of the provider to exclude the, the, the availability of the resources. Uh, yes, but I mean, if the certificates don't match, then it seems like a server error because the server is sending your certificate to the client. Oh, you, you mean like you mean like the the browser should mm -hmm. exclude? Oh, okay, yeah, might be. Yes, um, but then how how would the how would the browser know for sure? I mean, of course, then it can again just cut off not show the HTML page, might, would, might be an option. But because actually the u <laughs> Because actually the user's uh, environment has compromised the, the, secu the secure communication. Yes. So, yes, that might be an option. 
Is there some other? Oh, yeah. Uh, I know that it's not a security kind of conference and uh, it might be not uh, appropriate here, but I think that the largest problem with SSL at the moment as it stands is uh, certificate authorities, the mechanism of certificate authorities, because first of all, uh, it all uh, based on trust, how we trust the certificate authorities and the second thing, who can control them. Um, sorry, it's not a question, it's more like <laughs> a statement. Yes, but... Uh, and we can't do anything about it, pretty much. Uh, yes, I agree. I mean, in the DigiNotar case, browsers have been really strict, so browsers just removed the DigiNotar root certificate from, from their bundle, and then it, that wouldn't be trusted anymore. So that's maybe the way to go. Just be strict about it, and but then I mean, in that case, it was already too late. So I agree to the to your comment that it's really hard to control them, especially since I mentioned before it's over 650. So yes, the only way to go is that uh, browsers and operating system vendors need to be really strict and careful about it. And there are some people out there that say like. The way it is now, it's just completely broken. <laughs> the whole system of, especially with the NECA can sign any domain and all that. One, yeah. I have a question that somehow relates to the certificate authority question. Um, I'm wondering, is it possible to use SSL in a peer-to-peer -peer, um, communication context? Because there will be no proper common names of the hosts that communicate? Uh, sure, it is. Um, common name? You mean you want to use it in a browser or because actually... No, just any application protocol. Yeah, sure. I mean, you don't even need to need to check the common name. That's just like... Uh, of. That's just what browsers do. Okay, Th so that's not part of the protocol. It's not verified um, always. It's verified in the RFC for how to use SSL over HTTP, but if your application doesn't need to check that, then sure, you can also check the fingerprint or something like this. Uh, okay. Yes, thank you. Yep. Okay. So let's continue with SSL with Qt then. So how do you do SSL with Qt? Just a few general things. Qt is using OpenSSL in the background, and it DL opens it by default, but if you want, you can also configure it to be linked. So that's a configure switch, configure dash open SSL dash linked, then it will be linked. If you download the pre-compiled one, then it will DL open it. And it's using the one from your system. It doesn't ship an own one. On the client side, it's using SSL3, alt TLS 1.0. It supports server name indication which was the feature for the virtual hosting and all that. It's also using the root certificates from the system. So it was, Qt was shipping an own bundle up until, I think, 4.6. And from 4.7, we're using the root certs from the system. And in general, we're trying to implement whatever the web mandates, meaning if uh, Mozilla and Chrome implement it, then we might want to have that as well. It's a general rule of thumb. On the server side, um, well, we're not focusing that much on the server side, I have to say. One question that comes up a lot is that you can build your own SSL server by inheriting from TCP server and then you use a QSSL socket. Um, Marcus, earlier today, showed how you can subclass your TCP server and then I think you need to override this incoming connection method. Then you can use the SSL. Now let's look at the API. So, general network access API that you can use for HTTP and HTTPS. You have a queue network request, which contains a, contains a URL that resembles an HTTP request. You feed that request into your queue network access manager, which has methods for get and post and put. And you get back a queue network reply, which sends you signals for whenever you upload something or whenever there's new data from the server and then when it's finished. So, if you use SSL with HTTP, that's actually transparent. The URL that you see in the top left in the Q network request, if it contains HTTP, 
then it will use a QTCP socket internally. And in case the URL contains HTTPS, then it will use a QSSL socket. So you get the SSL all for free with some sane default methods, but you can also tweak, tweak the SSL behavior. So if you want to do SSL without HTTP on a socket level, there are some more classes that you can also, some of them access if you do HTTP. You have your QSSL socket with methods. By the way, a QSSL socket is a QTCP socket, so it offers the whole TCP plus the SSL handshake and everything. So you connect to host encrypted. The QSSL socket has a QSSL configuration, which is the basic class for fine-tuning your SSL uh, traffic. You can see the ciphers that are used. You can set the private key in case you want to send a certificate. You can check the CA certificates or set them. You can set the protocol if you want. And there are classes for all these attributes. There's a QSSL certificate class, which allows to query, for instance, the subject info, the issuer info, and other things. There's a QSSL key class. You can convert a key to PEM or to DR. You can get the type and the algorithm. And then there's also a QSSL cipher class. So that's just a little overview. If you want to fine tune your SSL traffic, there are all the QSSL classes that you can use. And sometimes you will also find a QSSL error. For instance, QNetwork reply has this signal SSL errors, and then it will give you an error, which says what the error was and the certificate that caused the error. One error that you might encounter might be the certificate has been self-signed or certificate has expired or something like this. Yes. Now there are some areas that you will need to be improved for Qt. If you Google for improving Qt's SSL support, there's a public, public Qt SSL page on the Qt developer network, created by Rich here in the audience, by the way. So if you want to check that out, you can check our sort of roadmap or some features that we consider important. And also feel free to add your own features if you want. So what's currently there is Certificate extensions, which is a uh, so that you can parse like the whole certificate, which is not possible yet with Qt. That certificate extensions is actually a prerequisite for the OCSP protocol, which also would be nice to have. Another interesting thing is something called abbreviated handshake, which is a performance improvement. You can save a round trip. We might want to look into that. And in general, there are a lot of performance improvements. And then again, if you have own ideas or if you think something is important, feel free to add it to the list or just send us a mail or send a mail on the public dev list or anything. Yes, so that's SSL with Qt. Any questions about SSL with Qt? There's one in the front. Thank you. A uh, few questions. Uh, first of all, um, due to the fact that uh, Qt uses open uh, SSL library, it obviously comes with, without uh, SSL support on uh, Windows platform. Is that right? That is right. You will have to download it uh, yourself. And, reco and, and recompile it. You don't, there are uh, pre-compiled versions of OpenSSL for Windows. So you don't mm -hmm. need to compile it yourself. You just need to download it in addition. And, and recompile Qt? Um, no, because it uh, DL opens it. So if you just need to set the paths so that it can f so Qt can find OpenSSL. You don't oh. need to, if you want to, you don't need to recompile it. Only you re only re need to recompile it if you want to use the linked version, if you want to link to it. Uh, OK. 
A second question is in regard to SSL errors and how to handle them. Uh, is it still possible to accept a connection uh, which does not pass the uh, security checks, uh, such as most common cases, self-signed certificates, especially if you work within your own server and client? Yes, that's possible. You just need to do a bit more work. You need to connect to a signal, like the SSL error signal from the mm -hmm. Kinetwork reply or the Kinetwork access manager. And then you can, you might want to inspect the error, what happened, and then you can ignore the errors. So there, I can show you. So here we have the Q-Network reply documentation. We have the signal SSL errors that you need to connect to a slot. And then you. I can see that. Sorry? It's, it's in the slots, obviously. Yes, and then you can, you can call ignore SSL errors. Mm -hmm. You can use either that method. So you need to construct the error, bef error before. And then you can say, OK, please ignore these errors. Or there's another method which you might want to use with great care, which just ignore, ignores all errors, which is this one. But again, it's, you might want to inspect the errors before you blindly ignore all, all of them. But of course, it's possible. Thank you. Welcome. More questions? OK, so I have three minutes left. I wonder if I should show you a little example. Yes, let's do that. So this is a very tiny console application, which just connects to a site and then shows you which certificate authority it uses. So in our header file, we just have one slot, and we have our Q Network Access Manager. If I switch to the C++ file, in the constructor, we create the Q-Network request from a URL. So we connect to q.nokia.com. We get that page via the Network Access Manager, and then we connect our, we connect the finished signal from the reply to, the, to our slot. So in the finished slot, what we do is that we first get the Q-Network reply by casting it from the sender, and then we just output the common name of the issuer, meaning the certificate authority that signed the certificate. So if I run that, OK, font is not very nice, but you see that q.nokia.com was signed by VerySign. Now we can, let's just try to connect to a few more sites and see what kind of, what certificate authority they use. We have our list of URL, then we just add some sites. Let's see what Facebook is using. Google. Twitter, you have any requests of what site we should check? Maybe eBay. I think the URL is called signin.ebay.com. 
So let's loop over those URLs. So we now create one request for each of those domains, and then we check which certificate authority they are using. Let's run that program. Yes, so you see Google uses Thoughty, Facebook uses Diggy Cert, which has nothing to do with Diggy Notar, by the way, and Twitter and eBay use VeriSign as well. So that was my very little example. So back to the slides. We're coming to the end. Now you see the example already. So this was the agenda. I hope you learned something about SSL and SSL with Qt. If I show you the slide from the beginning again, what was the goal of the presentation? I wanted to give you a little overview over the benefits and problems of SSL and summarized very shortly. <laughs> The benefits of SSL is that it provides secure communication, and the problem of SSL is that really secure communication is hard to achieve in practice because of all the different problems, like there's problems with the users, the servers, the certificate authorities, and all that. Then, how do you use SSL with Qt? With the Qnetwork Access API, you get it for free in a way. You just need to specify your URL with HTTPS, and then it will use SSL automatically. If you want to do SSL on, on a socket level, you just use the QSSL socket and the QSSL classes. Yes, so we're coming to the end. One more thing. Uh, if you want, please provide feedback. You can do that through the app or at the feedback kiosk at the reception. So it would be good to know if it was too slow, if you knew that already, or if it was too fast, if you couldn't follow, or if it was too technical or what you would have liked more, what you had expected. That would be nice. Otherwise, that's it from me. Feel free to ask some more questions. Thank you. Uh, are there any plans or uh, at least ideas when we will uh, have SSL functionality more exposed from QML, like usable from QML? Because currently, as I understand it, you have to go all the way down to Q Network Manager and then install your own stuff. Will that maybe be easier in the future directly? Because we reference often uh, resources from the web. Okay, so you, yeah, I see. There are no uh, concrete uh, plans yet. I mean, currently you would just have to do that all in C and then connect it manually with the signal and invocable and all that. So, w what you want is more. Uh, uh, signals or more uh, yeah, functionality from QML directly. Um, I haven't heard about that request before, so it's not high up on our list, I have to say, but sure, we could do that. If you... Oh, now the microphone is gone. Okay, so um, comment here is that you want to repeat it yourself, or shall I? <laughs> so, for example, when you're, we are referring to a resource, for example, an image through so HTTPS, and then it fails yes. in QML, it's very easy to reference it, but then it's very difficult to find out why exactly is it failing. So then it's a bit more difficult to discover. Yes. So. Uh, yes. Yes, that's true. So you would have to do that, do that in C++ currently to catch the error signal. So you would. Currently, you have to do some manual work to put like the error string to QML. That's true. So it's not that high on our prior priority list, but feel free to create a task in our bug tracker. And then if it gets more attention, then of course, we will look into that. One more question. Hello. Would you, Hello. Would you recommend to run, if you want to run SOAP in top of SSL? Um, that should work fine. I mean, SOAP is just uh, a protocol on top of HTTP, isn't it? So it should work just out of the box. 
this one. Which tools would you? For open? soap? Yeah. Um, well, there's a Qt soap solution, which is a bit old from Qt. Um, KDAP has a soap solution, and uh, the, um, if you go up to the CloudSmart booth, they also have a soap solution, so you might want to look into that. And then you get the SSL. It doesn't interfere with each other because soap works on top of HTTP, so that should work fine. Um, we have a question over here. Yes. Um, do you still have to ignore the SSL errors within the, the slot connected to the SSL errors signal? Um, not really. If I go back to the documentation, well, for this method, the ignore SSL errors, oh, where was it? Here, with the list, you can do that right away. But uh, in general, it's a problem because then the QNetwork Access Manager would block, right? You have to do that in a slot connected to, uh, like connected directly to a slot. Yeah. So that's a problem. That's what we want to change for Qt5, actually. So we want, yes, we want to change that you can, that the QNAM can continue running and that you only pause that connection until you have accepted or until you ignore the errors or not. So are there any plans to um, maybe specify a list of QSSL errors you want to ignore right away before you even connect? Yes, that's actually that method that uh, is shown here. You can construct a list of errors that you accept, and then you can ignore those right when you get the, the reply. So right after you do get, you ign ignore those errors, and then you won't even get the signal. So if you know which errors you get, for instance, self-signed certificate might be a case, and you can use that method, and then you don't need to connect the signal even. Does that help? Yeah. Good. One more question or comment? Uh, I just wanted to say there's a bit of a problem with ignoring the errors in advance because you actually need to know what the certificate is going to be that the error occurs on. So sometimes you might have to retry the request in that case, and I'm not sure if the uh, the actual QSSL certificate would, would match, so it, that will only work for some errors. Yes, that's true. So you need to know the certificate in advance. The use case here for that method was, for instance, self-signed certificates, when you know you connect to a server that uses a, uses a certificate that it's not trusted, but that you know in advance, then you can use that method. If you don't know exactly which certificate you, you get, then you can't use that method. That's true. OK, no more questions, then. I think that's it. We're done. Thank you.